some sports technology. Look, you gotta love a woman who has multiple academic degrees and multiple Olympic medals. Hockey legend Angela Ruggiero fits that bill as well as being a member of the International Olympic Committee. Pedro Rodriguez started his career as a physical therapist and after earning a PhD in biomechanics and kinesiology, he is the man that New Balance relies on to keep athletes free of knee pain and so much more. Dustin Cairo is responsible for business development and strategy in the sports realm for Zebra Technologies. From next-gen stats to player tracking systems, Dustin knows data collection and analysis. And finally, our moderator to me is really the epitome of what every professional athlete should aspire to be. Isaiah Kazavinsky is had tremendous success on and off the field. Seven years playing linebacker in the NFL, special teams captain, this close to a Super Bowl ring. Sorry, Isaiah, remind you of that. And as was reminded to me earlier in the day, shares the distinction of having shared a bunk bed at Harvard with Chris Nowinski. Somebody should tweet that question. Uh, while at Harvard as an undergrad and MBA, he started to think about the next phase of his life and is now a wildly successful entrepreneur who currently is with the wearable tech company MC10. These four individuals define the best in sports technology. Hello, it's great to be here. Uh, excited about this panel today. And um, by the way, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Andrea even knows the nickname for for both uh, Chris and I as roommates at Harvard. We had a we're both Polish, and our uh, our nickname was the Polish Connection. I was I was the middle linebacker, and he was uh, he was my nose tackle. Uh, I think he's here somewhere though. Um, yeah, I kind of want to start out, I'm going to cover a, a breadth of different topics today, and um, really wanted to start out with um, each of the panelists up here, going through a little bit of their experience, um, whether it be technology and sports in that intersection, um, but kind of, you know, how they got up here to this stage right now, and, and their viewpoint of their experience thus far, uh, is kind of like a starting point, and uh, Really excited about being able to hear and, and dive into a, a lot of different points of view up here. And you know, that was a great introduction around a, a lot of different uh, backgrounds as well. So with that, I, I kind of want to hand it over to, to Dustin and then uh, Pedro and then uh, Angela around being able to, to dive into that a little. Great. Go ahead. Well, excited to be here, guys. Um, my background really comes from the business side uh, in, in the tech space and in the wearable space. Um, while I was at school, I studied uh, business and sport management at Michigan. Uh, my first job uh, out of school I was working for a sports ag agency, uh, managing naming rights deals, so was able to get a good perspective into the business of sports, uh, specifically on the partnership and marketing end. Uh, and then from there, I joined Zebra Technologies, uh, working on business development and strategy. What we do at Zebra is we are the official player tracker provider for the NFL. So every single NFL athlete has two chips in their shoulder pads. These are the chips um, that collect location data, location and movement data. And from that XY data that we collect, we can tell you how fast someone's running, the total distance they've covered, acceleration, and deceleration, uh, and the orientation, which way they're facing. And what the legal do is they'll use that data from both a commercial standpoint. So when you watch NFL games, you might have seen next-gen stats. Um, and you might have seen those visualizations on the screen. Um, and then on the other side, they'll use it from an operational, from an operational standpoint um, so that teams and players can optimize performance uh, and coaching strategies. Pedro, go ahead. Yeah, and um, my, <coughs> excuse me. my name's uh, Pedro Rodriguez. I uh, started as a physical therapist. I went to the University of Connecticut, and then after graduation, I worked in sports medicine clinics working on uh, a number of athletes. Um, but when I was in those settings, I was really interested in why are these people getting injured. I uh, had a ton of questions, so decided to go back to school to study biomechanics. Um, while I was there, I started looking at footwear really closely at UMass Amherst and uh, was able to uh, ha take a position at New Balance where 
I study footwear's effects on athletes' performances um, and also on injury at this, po at this point. Um, so we have a lab up in Lawrence, Mass. that's really high tech. We get all kinds of data on athletes, how they're moving, joint angles, et cetera. And uh, really where I am excited about wearables is being able to take that sort of setting and collecting that data on people in real life uh, places. So on the football field, as Dustin was talking about, while they're out on a run versus just in lab settings. Um, and I think it's going to unlock a lot of uh, questions and uh, also give us a lot of answers when we combine those two things. Cool. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the intro, Isaiah. Um, Angela Ruggiero, I was a four-time Olympian in ice hockey. Um, my first Olympics, I was 18 years old. Uh, a lot of people say, how did you make the Olympic team at 18? And um, I was obsessive with, you know, the old analytics, piece of paper, <laughs> writing down, you know, your, your, any, any data you could have. I mean, what was tracked um, back then, you know, your height, your weight, I mean, really not much, your bench press, maybe your squat. And it, so as I continued to evolve in my career and data became more readily available, um, I was obsessive about it. Um, our team tracked heart rate uh, in the 2010 Olympics. Um, so we really could tell uh, in our training, you know, what programs were, helped us be effective versus not which athletes were in shape coming into preseason, you know, versus the ones that might have taken some time off. Um, and so I just became really obsessive understanding, like, I could actually incre dramatically increase my performance through data analytics, through um, tracking my heart rate, through tracking my sleep, through tracking my nutrition, um, any, anything that was giving me more objective analysis versus the subjective, which typically, you know, we relied on in the past. So, um, so my personal experience, obviously, is, uh, is one that, you know, as I became older, um, I relied more on analytics. And you see players today that obviously are, you know, that it's, it's everything. You see teams obviously tracking more analytics. Um, now I'm on the International Olympic Committee, uh, serve with the Los Angeles bid, and we're, you know, there's so much in the sport presentation side. So now I'm on the other side of the fence looking at how do we take the analytics of the athletes and, and help promote sport through, the, through this data? And I, I think it's a really interesting space that, that we'll get to. That's a good, uh, yeah, I kind of want to touch on that a little um, around this, this idea of, you know, the way I looked at the world when I was a player, I was, I was trying to find that, that edge in, in any way as possible. I was always, you know, as a fringe player, I always felt like my next game could be my last game and um, always constantly looking for that, you know, that the extra 1% of, of improvement somewhere and being able to dial that in some, somehow. And I, I, you know, as I looked, you know, as I went through my career and, and looked at, you know, how I prepared, I, I, I always felt like I was, I was constantly guessing. And I think that speaks to a lot of the points that you guys made uh, right up here, and especially what you're talking about, uh, Angela. You know, I think, you know, I, I, you know, for example, you know, when there was ever a question of, you know, was there enough work put in, and I didn't know I was going to work harder. And I think for large parts of my career, and, you know, I, I was I essentially say, you know, my whole career, I, I was overtraining constantly. Instead of being able to essentially dial in different ways in, in which I, I could train. And I think there's this broad scope and broad opportunity, I think, where you essentially could take that, that guesswork out of it. And, you know, to that point, you know, I'd, I'd like to be interesting to hear some of the perspectives up here on, you know, how do you see how you can take some of that guesswork out and essentially create a blueprint in which you can not only train, but, you know, dial in performance in a way where you can put yourself in the best position to feel good. And when you feel good, you have the best opportunity to play good. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily, is not limited to the field or the rink or the court, right? Um, that, that's really relevant to, to every single one of us. Uh, you, know, you know, even myself, you know, right now and everybody in the audience right now, be, everybody wants to feel good. And uh, I think you really have the potential to increase that. But, you know, what do you think of the, the main pieces of guesswork you can take out of it? I'll speak broadly to it in, in, in a football lens. Um, if you think about the game of football, the stats uh, and the data that we have haven't changed in, in 40 years. We've been really been using the same statistics. Um, and what we've had is really just output statistics. All we've had is saying that this individual gained this many yards, 
he had this many receptions, he scored this many touchdowns. And so we've known what their output was, what they did. But we never really understood why that happened. Why were they able to achieve what they did? So we weren't able to know well, how much pressure was on the quarterback, and that's why he threw an interception. We had no way of quantifying that. We couldn't truly tell you what was the separation that a receiver had on a defensive back in, in order for Odell Beckham to make that amazing catch, right? Or how fast did he run? Or how high did he jump? And so what we've been able to do with wearable data is we can now can collect that why information. We can collect those inputs, and we can start to tell stories of exactly exactly what is happening. And we can use those stories both from a performance standpoint so that now you can understand exactly how should I be training so that I can have a specific output in the game. But from a commercial lens too, we can start to add more context to what is going on so you can understand, well, why was Odell Beckham able to make that incredible catch? One of the, one of the things I'm actually excited, I think that's a really cool question is uh, because I think everyone has a different uh, a different level that they can handle. Everyone's working hard as an athlete, mm -hmm. but people will heal at different rates. Um, so some of these internal facing markers that like MC10 is making, um, we know how many steps an, an athlete's taking, how fast they're running, how long they're running for, but finding out how does their body respond to that and when they're ready for something like that again is probably very individualized. Um, and you can, I think an athlete can a lot of these sensors, the, the good thing about them is your body actually has these same sensors inside. You just have to kind of tune yourself to know it. But trying to tell somebody outside that this is how my body's feeling, I need time off, some of that data helps validate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think having that customized approach to each athlete, this is their stimulus, they've been able to handle it, they've recovered, and now they can handle it again, um, is going to be really beneficial when it comes to performance and, and injury prevention, I believe. Do you have any specific metrics around, you know, you know, I know there's some, some broad metrics, but yeah, and then there might be ones that are sports specific for sure. Is there anyone that, you know, stands out as an example for you, either a metric or a sport specific type of, you know, algorithm that you could say, hey, if you could dial this in and take guesswork out of, you know, quality of reps for this or this or that, you know, do you have any examples around that? Yeah. I, I don't have any specific that I've studied, but I would think like something like resting heart rate or just even tracking um, like the velocity of an athlete during a, a practice, something like that. But there's probably other internal facing markers that uh, somebody in, in biology would that, that would probably be able to tell you that, hey, if this marker is still elevated, there's likelihood that that person is still healing from that specific stimulus. Yeah, yeah I would just add to that. Um, so when you're training to be you know, an elite athlete, you're literally training to be the most healthy person on the planet. <laughs> That's your job. Uh, obviously, there's the analytics that are sports specific. Your, you know, your health, your velocity on the ice, or your slap shots. You know, there's certain metrics, but the metrics I would want to see that I tracked are your sleep. There's optimal sleep, and every person's different. Your hydration, right? Uh, there's an optimal amount for that. Your you know, your heart rate, obviously, your recovery in that heart rate, your, you know, so your cardiovascular system. Um, you could test, um, you know, if you're injured, again, the, 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 you know, I had shoulder injuries several times as an athlete, uh, the functionality of my shoulder. So there's um, your, the amount of time that, you, that you're at rest, you know, your mental health. Um, there, so there are a lot of trackers, I think, that apply to the general population that aren't, that are, it's really interesting to have the sports specific. I think it's cool. And obviously if you're an, if you're an elite athlete, I mean, you live and die by the, those, you know, those 2% you can get. But more broadly speaking, the stuff you're tracking is for everyone. And that to me is where I think this, this new technology coming out will really have on the healthcare side, um, will really make a huge difference. So I don't know if you guys have um, specific things that, I mean, that you've tracked just personally that you recognize that actually this, you know, the, the, the old 220 minus your age we talk about for your heart rate is like, you know, finger in the wind, what you think is the right, you know, number, but actually if you're tracking your heart rate, you recognize, no, my heart rate is actually more elevated or it's slightly slower and, and therefore your training should adapt accordingly. No, I think, I mean, you, you brought one up for me that, you know, I actually had a tangible experience around when I was still playing, which is hydration. I was a severe cramper, uh, full body lockups, the whole deal. Um, 
you know, several times over is getting IVs before games at a halftime, the whole deal. And I was literally terrified. But, it's, but I was constantly guessing on how much sweat I was losing and how much I was trying to replace, uh, as well as the composition of that sweat. I didn't know anything I was losing. And finally, I, in my third year, I was um, sh shuttled off to the Gatorade Sports Science Institute as a way to, like, let's define how much he's actually losing per hour of vigorous activity, so sweat rate and composition, that's it that sweat, so sodium, potassium, calcium. And it was a way, you know, going through that process, I knew my sweat, weight, sweat rate per hour. I actually ended up breaking the Gatorade Sports Science Institute record for sweat, almost a gallon of sweat so that's next. in one hour. Uh, it was pretty gnarly. It's, it's since been broken, I know that for sure. Uh, and as well as the composition of that. You should be proud that, as you. I'm as super you proud. <laughs> and as well as the composition of that sweat, um, you know, the, my sodium, for example, was twice that uh, per, you know, the same unit volume. Uh, the concentration was at twice that of a normal individual, right? So I was fighting this uphill battle. I wasn't going to be able to win regardless of I, how much I drank. So I had to supplement uh, electrolytes into the drink and then dial that in and quantify that, take that guesswork completely out of a way uh, that really helped me the rest of my career. That was my third, third year, and it was, it was really, really making a difference on how I performed, as well as, you know, obviously taking me out of games in third, fourth quarters, you know, crunch time uh, in a lot of ways. I think that's a great example of something I had personal experience around that took all that guesswork out and dialed it in and, and made a huge, huge difference. And, you know, there's, there's physiology labs across the country that can tell you, and there's papers written um, across the board around, you know, the the decreases in mental and physical uh, performance from, from dehydration. That's, I think that's a, that's a really good example, but I think there is examples across the board I think you can really talk about. I mean, I think another one you alluded to was this injury precursor, uh, the ability to really look at in uh, you know, larger sets of data, but to understand through objective data capture, um, you know, uh, differences on, on right and left sides of the body where you know somewhere hardware, some ways hardware can can really limit you if you're tied only to just a strap on the on the wrist or a strap around the, the core. Uh, doing that and driving insight is, is hard to do. Um, but yeah, I, I think yeah, that, I think I, I want to dive into that a little more. Is there kind of metrics all around the body um, that you know to this to this point of guesswork? Anyone that might be even sport specific too. Uh, if you think about sport. And um, you know, I think about even going back and you think about quality reps and dividing, um, you know, this huge upfront piece of uh, performance that you try to dial in that training in, in some way uh, and making sure the quality reps are as, as good as you can possibly making, make it and have some feedback loop. Is, is there anything that jumps out that, that, that might be good? And I think it speaks to what you talked about is, you know, being an elite athlete, your body is your business. And, and that's what you do. Yeah, just to add, I mean, your, yeah, your body is your business. Your job is to know your body. So the more data you can have to understand that, the better you're going to be. Um, you know, I come from a team sport where typically you're treated the same, which is bizarre in my opinion because you have different body types, you have different ages, you have different experience, and so having the same standard plan, uh, you know, you're, I think you're seeing like hockey teams evolve and say, oh, okay, we might this player's older, they might actually need less training. They're going to overtrain uh, and go stretch, you know, go spend more time resting. These younger players need more reps. Um, so injury prevention you talk about, you're, if you're a, you know, a pitcher, you're, you know, you take lots of shots in hockey, you actually develop these imbalances. And so over the course of, you know, a 10, 15 year pr professional career, you're going to have more imbalance than your rookie season. And so if you could somehow capture that for the athlete, I think in a way that allows them to have the data and have experts analyze the data. That's the thing we were talking about backstage too is, look, I can have all the data in the, in the world, but if I don't know what that means, if I don't know, you know, a 2% change in my right versus left, how is that going to affect me? Having people, having experts that can come and then tell me, okay, you're going to need to do more reps on your left side or we're going to have to strengthen your left side or... We're gonna, you're going to need to take this shift off, Angela, or take this day off because you're getting old. I mean, that kind of level of sophistication, I think, is the next wave and how we'll see you know, professional sports and elite athletes. I don't, I don't know if you guys are tracking that with NFL or New Balance. Yeah, I think um, two points to be made to, kind of to the football lens as well as to kind of what are the metrics that people are looking at. Um, 
the first thing that we tell all teams and really anyone that we speak to about our technology is that it's not about big data, it's about agile data. So it doesn't matter how much data you have, but if you can't find value from that data, if you can't tell stories about that data, then it's of no, no use to you. So we don't care about big data, we care more about agile data. Um, and I think right now, and in the past, I think people just wanted to collect data, collect as much data as you possibly can. But now we're starting to realize, well, we can't tell stories around all of that data. We more so want to have agile data. The second piece is I think we're still right now in a stage where we're just trying to deploy these systems in a game or even in a practice and live environment. It's one thing to be able to sh strap a device on somebody in a lab, but it's another thing to track 330 plus NFL games and 2,500 NFL athletes across an entire season. Um, so the ability just to deploy some of these tracking systems, I think is the first hurdle and the first challenge that leagues and, and players and data scientists had. And we're getting very close and in, in specifically in the NFL, um, as well as I think in, in baseball, they've done a, a great job of deploying those systems. Now we actually have data that we can play around with where we can start to say what are the important metrics um, for people to look at in terms of performance and then also on, on the commercial end what's interesting to the fan as well. Yeah, this is actually an area that I think is really exciting. I'm not sure if anyone's doing this yet, but um, you're, how you discussed someone having potentially more asymmetries or mm -hmm. starting to move differently. Um, so again, I come more from a, a lab setting where I can really control the athlete's going to do this movement this many times. Mm -hmm. I'm measuring every joint angle that they have um, in these specific movements. But then I'm not really capturing a ton of data of them on, on ice or in their specific sport or over practices. Um, so I think pairing those two things is going to be interesting because that athlete might not have asymmetries <coughs> today, but towards the end of the practice, you may start to see something. Uh, as they fatigue, they start to become more asymmetrical, and then you can pull them in the lab and say, oh, this asymmetry is coming because you have more knee flexion on this side or more torso uh, side bending on one side as you get fatigued or as your career progresses, and that might be the trigger. You're collecting that data all the time, but that might be the trigger to say, hey, you have to come back in the lab, let's check you out, or talk to your medical profession, because that's, that's the trigger. I think there's going to be a, a really cool intersection there at some point. I think there's also a point of, of education, uh, educating the athletes, educating coaching staffs. I'd be interested to hear both of your perspectives as athletes, but uh, from what I've heard in terms of athletes and, and how they feel about the data, is you get two point of views. You get one point of view, which has been said already, and that the value of having this information to know what's happening with your body and to be able to act on it. But the other side of it is, well, now a manager or a GM knows when I'm slowing down or they know when my performance is, is as I'm, now that I'm getting older, and that's something that they could use in a, in a contract negotiation. So you, ha you have to look at it at both lenses. I'd be interested to hear from your guys' perspectives, team sport, and team sport, I guess, as well, um, how you feel about that. Yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword in, in, some, in some ways. Um, you know, I really see the, you know, the tremendous value in, in coming from, you know, the athlete themselves on, uh, this ability to get better and dial in how you get better and um, actually you know the the body's not like you know the wandering path of the stock market right uh, it's actually pretty reproducible when you treat it in a very similar way and you know being able to do that uh, over time is, is great so being you know going back to that, that that analogy of you know your body is a business the ability to help me play longer play better perform better feel better, uh, I have to see value in that. Obviously, there has to be constraints around you know, being able to use uh, information come, come contract time, right? In the end, you wouldn't want uh, information to be used across the board for that. Um, but the, the true ability to be able to, to dial that in, in 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 a lot of different ways and really, really help um, me perform the best I can possibly perform. By the way, like if you're an owner of a of a of a team, you'd probably want your entire team to feel as good as they can come game day, and do that in every single possible way that you can. I don't know. That's my perspective. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it is a double-edged sword. I think um, if you actually use the data though and can be a better athlete and prolong your career and you know make more money or whatever it is you want, I mean. 
Fantastic. Uh, win more gold medals. I mean, that's that, that that ultimately is the goal to have that data. So you, I have the if we have the same data and I use it and you don't, like good for me. Uh, uh, the data is going to be out there. On the other on the other hand, as you mentioned, um, yeah, it could be dangerous um, for you know you're going to get cut. But what is an athlete? An athlete isn't just data. An athlete isn't just how fast you know you can run the 40 yard dash. There's performance in the clutch. I mean. I always say the difference between a good athlete and a great athlete is like your mind. You can't, so, so, and you can't really track that. So I think the data we're talking about is like physiological, um, injury prevention, it's hydration, it's things that will actually help your career, but it doesn't completely define the athlete. And I think, you know, you look at Hall of Famers, uh, you look at the greatest athletes, they aren't just about, you know, how quickly they can run, they're really about, you know, making that clutch play in the last minute. And, and that, that's where I think there's a little bit of a distinction. Um, I would say, I think it'll be interesting to say then, does the athlete own the data at the end of the day? Does the market own the data? Do the consumers own the data? Because I would, as a, as a fan now, God, I, I would love to see where people's heart rates are, where, what, you know, where their metrics are. That's entertaining for me, but then ultimately who owns it is a big question. I'll leave that to the lawyers who spoke earlier. No, but you, I mean, you raise a good point. It's something yeah we can we can dive into now, which is you know you look at collection of data. There is there's performance side, which we've started out talking about, but there's also this this media content, this engagement platform that um, you know I like to think of it as you know like fantasy sports on steroids, like you know really really this this high level of engagement to see you know LeBron James at the the free throw line and to see his heart rate or. You know, Adam Vinatieri kicking a field goal at the end of the game, seeing his heart rate and, and other metrics as well, even, you know, uh, kicking power. There's a whole, a whole bunch of other things that really open up for you when you start to put uh, sensors on body as well. Um, how do you guys think about, you know, what do you think the real opportunity is as we look towards the future and, you know, looking at different opportunities both in performance and uh, also in this media content play? Uh, where do you think the real play is? Or, you know, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. How do you think they're going to dovetail? I'll, I'll take the media and business side. Um, I think there's immense value in, in the data. Um, I think it can be a kind of a next evolution to how we, how we view uh, sports, whether that be um, linear TV or through a secondhand experience. Um, you're already starting to see some of it with the NFL in their use of next-gen stats on CBS broadcasts and NBC broadcasts, as well as during this year's Super Bowl. Um, and I think MLB actually does an amazing job with using their system, TrackMan. We saw that come to life this year in the World Series. So I think there's a lot of value from a business standpoint in that it will allow fans to better understand the story that's going on and why things are happening. Um, and it you know, provides another revenue stream then for the uh, broadcasters or the league properties to sell sponsorships on that data. The thing I'm most excited about in the future is, uh, you know, I've been studying running injuries now for 10 or so years. And uh, again, in a mostly a lab setting, I'm, I'm excited to combine that, that data um, collected on runners across the, across the world, um, allowing us to have their data in addition to collecting other sorts of data, not just how, how far do they run, um, how fast did they run, but also things like how are you feeling today, why did you stop running, did, were you injured, and then starting to put that together to answer questions that researchers have had a hard time answering, why exactly do people get runnered, or runners get injured. Um, and, and in that same light, I wanted, right now I feel like most of the statistics we're getting are descriptive in nature, so they're telling you I've, I took 10,000 steps today, my heart rate is X, um, and I think people do get bored with those sorts of things, so I'm looking forward to those more prescriptive stats, statistics um, to tell you like, all right, this is a good zone for you, or all of a sudden you ramped up too fast. Every time we've seen that in the past, people typically start to get injured. Uh, based on your profile, I would suggest doing X. So I think I'm excited about that prescriptive nature of things. Um, and then the third place I'm actually really excited about, so I kind of look at these sensors as internal facing sensors, which are uh, picking up your physiological signals, et cetera, how, how often am I moving? Um, but then there's also the external facing um, sensor. So Zebra technology knows where I am relative to my opponent, relative to the next person. 
Um, and as you were bringing up, really your, your decision making on the field is really important, how good of an athlete you are, not just that I run fast, uh, but for the everyday consumer, we don't get those sorts of statistics. So we're, you know, you're playing soccer, I don't know if the guy was next to me, how I reacted to him. And combining those two things for the everyday person, I think it's gonna be really cool. And then you could even like, I might beat you to the punch, but uh, taking that sort of data and then feeding it into a, a VR system where you can say, these are the scenarios that I did well in, not did what didn't do well in, or even video games. It's a crazy thought, but you could take that external facing stuff and the decisions you have to make in that world uh, correspond yeah. to what you saw. Yeah, virtual reality, I think is definitely a big thing. I would you know, we'd love to chat about, um, but taking the-, the Dive right into it, go ahead. <laughs> But uh, no, just just on this point, real quick, the, turning, making it easy for the consumer, taking all this data that you're, you're collecting at the elite level, and then I think applying it to the everyday person, I think is is the next generation of, okay, we're almost guinea pigs, you know, at the elite level now, collecting stats, and maybe technology will get to a po price point where it's affordable for for everyone. Um, but but you know, I would love my iPhone or you know your your phone just to ring and say, hey, Angela, like, drink some more water. Or, hey, you're, you're limping because, you know, your, your bag is too heavy running through the airport, like, switch shoulders. Or, you know, like, l literally everyday things that will h help make you a healthier person. And obviously, I know, like, MC10 is doing a lot just in that space, just really trying to understand and collect data and save it in an area where, you know, you can, you can use it through time. Um, but I think, I mean, I would love to see the next space. Now, maybe because I'm you know, not, I'm a retired athlete. Um, how can I use this kind of data in my everyday life? Um, but yeah. And yes, I, so I think that's like both you guys bring up really good points, which is like there's a massive body of data in New Balance and you guys have a running lab and that's where you, you spend day in and day out. And you know, the way I look at that, there's a ton of really valuable data to unlock from that via the right hardware across the board. In the end, um, you know, you're, you're gathering a snapshot of information. People come into the running lab and they, they run on force plates and you're, you're benchmarking it. To take that information and then transfer it over, um, if you're tied to the wrist, if you're tied to uh, some, some strap on the core and you're not able to benchmark to lower extremities, this, you know, to that example, um, it's gonna be impossible, right? So really, really unlocking um, different tools to be able to take that from a snapshot to a longitudinal data capture, going to provide massive amounts of data, uh, especially around right, right and left sides of the body, and really unlock insight that we didn't have before in a real-world data capture setting. And that's been elusive, as you as you mentioned, for researchers for a long period of time. And quite honestly, why MC Ted and was founded, and why we've developed what we have, and in, in the BioStamp, and um, truly trying to quantify the human body with real world data and take the, those snapshots and run them uh, amok uh, among, you know, larger section of populations that really, really help define uh, a new category of, you know, injury prevention as well as you know, optimized performance. So taking that. No, I think rehabilitation too. I think we, when people come back from injury, we really have no idea where they are and when they really should be coming back. Because you don't, you, you, you don't know what those internal monitors in your body are necessarily telling you. And something like an MC10 device, which Isaiah is wearing three of right now, um, <laughs> I am. Um, those can help you to understand, you know, okay, this athlete, uh, he's ready. Or, you know, no, we need to wait a month. Uh, otherwise, we're going to lose him for the postseason. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think anyone that's ever been injured, I mean, I, I, we all have up here. And, you know, I've, I've had 11 surgeries in my body. And uh, we played it with a pretty reckless style. But I, I remember one of the, one of the biggest problems was um, not really knowing when exactly I was, I was back to being myself and not being able to quantify that in a way where uh, that was really, really frustrating. I think that speaks to the rehabilitation point, just coming back from injury, having some baseline of where you were with functional movement, where you actually function on the field and uh, you know, the, the court and the, the rink, whatever you're doing, being able to do that is highly, highly valuable. There's no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I had shoulder surgery. I remember coming back from it, range of motion. You know, my arm actually didn't go as far back as I needed it. When you're shooting, you know, a few extra degrees actually makes a huge difference. And I didn't have that baseline, actually. So, um, you know, it, it ha if I had a longitudinal 
data capture of my movement, my heart rate, I mean, all these metrics that we're talking about and could compare it through time for different situations. I mean, that would, I think, be a game changer for, for athletes. And, you know, whether it's when you're coming back from injury or, or you're getting older or you're, you know, whatever the case may be, and for people, for that matter. Um, but, yeah, it's the, I think it's the longitudinal, like, being able to capture it and compare as opposed to that, like, point in time, which, um, it, you know, there's nothing relative to put it against. And, and capture it in the actual setting as opposed to in a lab, too. Yeah, those, those time points when you don't know, like, after surgery, am I doing well, not doing well, that'd be awesome info for that the physician looking at that person or the PT saying you're, you're right on track, you're not right on track, and give that person that feedback. Um, the other part, too, like, I think a lot of, we have a lot of these sensors in our body, but sometimes we tune them out. Um, and your example of walking through the airport and my bag's kind of hanging off mm -hmm. is an interesting one because I think our body tends to feel it and then it kind of starts to ignore it. So something there to remind you when you do lose your sen your own personal sensor, stop talking, um, is kind of a neat neat concept as well. I hadn't thought of that. I want I want to talk uh, a little bit about um, yeah, and I think we're already speaking around it a little, but this idea of you know capturing during you know two hours of really really intense activity versus the 22 hours when you're you're not doing that intense activity and. Um, Angela, you actually already alluded to one of them, which is you know one of the low hanging fruits that uh, yeah I was a big believer around from when I was in high school, all the way throughout was I was hardcore set on sleep being one of the biggest um, markers for myself on performance, and I was a nine hour guy um, of sleep, and I was dedicated to being able to do that as much as possible. I still am. I still try to be um, around that, and I know the benefits that I was able to achieve through that um, for that. But being able to you know, capture this this 24 hours a day of, you know, the athlete is not just those two hours, right? The athlete is all 24 hours. I mean, shoot, we all are at all times. And, and, and on top of that, there's a richness and quality of the data. I want, you know, you, Pedro, you probably have a, a perspective around this, but not all data is made the same. The raw data coming in uh, can only be filtered so much. And um, you can only tell, you know, with some type of proxy with an algorithm what, you know, if I've got a device on my wrist, what is, is going to happen on the, the lower extremity. So kind of I'd like to hear your perspective on, on dovetailing those two, two aspects if, if you have a point of view on both. Yeah, I, I think the marriage of those two things are, are huge. And yeah, like you said, not all data is created equal. There's some that's noisy, like how, how accurate do you need to be really probably depends on the question you're answering or what, what action you take on it. So, you know, maybe how accurate do I need to be on take how many steps I took today it might not be as important as um, knowing my heart rate for, you know, say in a medical application with one of your stamps to inform a doctor on when he should make that call is, is an extremely important uh, thing. But yeah, collecting data all day long is, uh, is very important, I think, um, to really tell the whole story if we're really interested in, in knowing why people are getting injury and injured and why people are performing best on certain days. Yeah, we, our team, uh, I remember before the 2010 Olympics, we had a journal we had to keep and we'd show it to our coaches and you wake up first thing in the morning, you take your pulse in bed. Then you would kind of write, how are you feeling that day? Are you energized? Are you motivated? Scale of one to 10. You'd, you know, you'd get to the rink, you'd weigh in before practice, you'd weigh out. That would, you know, kind of approximate how much water you had to drink to, to rehydrate. You'd go to the gym, you know, you'd be recording your, your weights. I mean, we were trying to capture what we could, but it was so subjective in some cases. And then you had to put it all together. And your strength coach is looking at certain data, and your on-ice coach is looking something else. You're looking at it. I mean, and then assuming they have to sit in the room and talk about it for each athlete. I mean, at the end of the day, I basically, as an individual athlete, you had to try to put it all together. Um, and that's why I think the analysis piece is so important. Like if someone could objectively capture these data points, put it together in some beautiful algorithm <laughs> and tell, you know, tell the athletes, tell the everyday person like what, where they're, they're slacking off. Like, hey, notice a pattern. Maybe if there's an algorithm that says, look, you're sleeping seven hours a night and you're consistently waking up tired or at the end of the day you're getting more fatigued or you're getting injured and, and, and analyzed it and said, you actually need nine hours. I mean. Anyway, I, th I think it's, it's moving in that direction, but it's like the collection and aggregation 
of it um, and analysis of it, I think that's exciting with like you're saying, you're, you're wearing stamps right now. We know, you know, if you move, move to the left or move to the right or, or go for a run, you're capturing that. If, and that to me is, is something that athletes aren't doing 24 hours a day and, and I think that's where it will go. Thank you guys. Yeah, I think the holy grail, if you talk to any trainer, um, specifically in the NFL, those are most of who I talk to, is the holy grail is um, injury prevention. If you can tell me, okay, this person is hit, this player load number, they put this much output on their body, that means that they're getting this close to being injured, that's what they're looking for. And I think while you'll never get a number that says, okay, this is the exact number, because it's there's a lot of other factors that go into injury prevention. We're going to get close to that, but it, it takes time because we need number of data sets to be able to look at. We then need machine learning to be able to take that data and find out what are those predictors, what is the analysis that needs to be done. So I think we're we're getting there, but it, it's it's baby steps to actually being able to play with that data and find out what are the specific things that we should be looking at. I did have a question. You're, I haven't tracked myself other than a, a Fitbit on my wrist yeah. for 24-hour periods. Um, you obviously have probably more experience with the patches that you do wear. What, have you found anything really interesting that you're like, oh, I didn't really, hadn't thought that or didn't feel it or would yeah, I think one of, my, one of our biggest things, obviously, I'm not going to get into every single thing that, that we've uh, started to look at, but you know, our biggest thing is building a huge bank of, of raw data from all around the body. Um, I think one of the biggest things, and yeah, I think from the consumer mindset, I'll just give one example, um, is, is around, you know, we've done, you know, we've got 85 people in our company now, and uh, we all are wearing patches, you know, bio stamps all the time and capturing data, and, you know, we've got algorithms we can filter through that are, are different. One of the beauties of doing this is um, going through your day and, you know, working out and doing what you want to do is actually getting credit for what you're doing. And you don't do that if you're um, doing something, if, say if you're riding a bike and, and you're, you have something on your wrist and you want to get credit for that, you're not gonna, it's not going to happen. That's kind of like something that uh, yeah, I think is a good example for, for everyone. But when you're wearing um, sensors on your lower extremity, on your core, on, um, on your upper extremities as well, you're actually getting credit for literally every single activity you're doing throughout the day. And that's a very, very powerful thing. You start to have a ton of confidence, not only in the, in the, in the capture of the data, but that this data is actually telling a story of what my day looks like. This is a very accurate capture of what, what it looks like. And I don't care if you're an elite athlete or an elderly woman in a home. It doesn't matter. If you capture data accurately, it's going to tell that story. I think it's a really interesting point, though, because you talk about applying it then, this, this science to the everyday person. And um, yeah, like I wear a Fitbit. I sit on the bike for 30 minutes. I didn't take a step. <laughs> um, but if you're, you're talking about like working in the corporate world now um, and getting people moving at the, in the corporate side and people that sit at a desk all day and, and sharing that data across, I mean, I'm just really interested because how, do how do you motivate people? And, and these little, if you get credit for the things you're doing and you can see that you're actually, it's affecting your health. Again, taking that data and saying, well, what does that mean? Um, if you can show you're actually getting healthier, maybe you're getting leaner or stronger or whatever it applies to, I think that could change like the corporate sector because then, you know, we're going to encourage each other as a company. Um, and at the same time, like if you're starting a health program for the first time and I can see your data and it, it, I don't know, it, I'm, I'm just big on motivation and data is motivation in my opinion. No, I, mean, I, think, I think that's a good point. You're you're not only talking about this, the uh, tapping the inner competitor in every single person, but also in the end, this is all about making us all feel as good as we can, going back to the other comment we did. And in the end, if you feel as good as you can, are you gonna be awesome at your job? Most likely. <laughs> You're gonna be as good, as good as you as you can, right? I go back to, I completely agree with that. I go back to a point though that you made in that it's one thing to collect all this data, but we need to know what action to take on it. Um, and I think, so I, I wore a wearable, I wore a, a jawbone up for maybe six months and I stopped wearing it because all I was getting was just numbers or data and I didn't know how to actually act on that information. Part of it was also, to your point, I, to work out a kickbox and I wasn't getting any, it wasn't, my workouts weren't getting applied to what I was doing because I was wearing it on my wrist. So I think as you, as young students, think about where there's opportunity out there, 
It's how are we actually taking this information and being able to make decisions off of it? What's the value that we're able to get from it? And I think we've got a ton of, we're getting a ton of information from Jawbone, from Apple Watch, from Fitbit, and so forth. The next space is how are people taking action from that information? I'm going to get back to you guys each, you know, uh, yeah, really tailored to the audience we have here on, you know, there's a, you know, a varied amount of ways in which you can involve yourself in sports and technology at intersection. Um, and, you know, I think this is a really good example of this, this panel up here. I want you guys to be able to answer that. But first, I want to go to a couple of tweets here. There's a couple of questions um, to the panel. And uh, you guys can answer this however you want. But is there a potential for analytical or techn technological advancements in sports to lead to new forms of PEDs or unfair advantages? I think it's a really good question. Um, it's tweets by Andres, <laughs> if you're here. Oh, awesome, I like it. That's a good question. It's a really, really good question. So I'll answer that by saying I think at the end of the day, it, it just depends on um, making sure that no athlete has a competitive disadvantage, right? Um, if every athlete is on an equal playing field uh, and, and every athlete has the opportunity to use the device, um, then I, I, I don't think you'll see that issue. I, th I think internet, so on the International Olympic Committee, we, we've actually looked at this and said, where can we use technology to level the playing field? Because right. there are countries around the world that don't have this technology, and it's a huge advantage that we have in sports science here in the US and you know more developed countries. Um, so how can you use technology to level it? Um, but at the same time, um, it's, not a, it's, it, it's never gonna be level. I mean, that's just, we're all going to try to say, okay, we can have this baseline, but we're going to go over here and try to develop better capabilities and protect those capabilities so that our athletes benefit and no one else does. So I definitely think there's a huge competitive advantage through using data and technology. Um, but at the same time, if at least want to get, get other countries up to speed, I mean, heart rate, for example, is an easy one. Anyone could relatively cheap to get heart rate monitors, but that's just one piece of data, um, and you'd hope everyone would have access to it. Um, but I don't know, affordability is a big thing. Um, I mean, if you guys want to talk to this, because again, across the globe, I see it. We want it to help level playing field, but we know that it's just like doping or other, other things in sport actually will materially change outcomes. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, before I go to the next tweet, this, that brings up a really good question. Like, so based on this huge body of experience, I, I, I mentioned, I, I know for a fact, um, you know, where sleep made a huge difference on my mental and physical performance. Just, I just, I knew, I knew it, I felt it, and I could tell a huge difference uh, either way. Do you have, if you look back in your career and say, hey, this actually made a really big difference. When I tracked this, it made a big difference. And, you know, that could be aimed at you, but it could be aimed at anyone else up here um, around, what did I dial in or did it feel like, you know, for me, I knew, you know, if I could have dialed in energy expenditure in a really accurate way, how much I was you know, having this output in, in an accurate way, which I could say, hey, let's cap it at this amount of energy expenditure throughout the day. And, you know, you know more after this, this and this and dial it in that leads me to feel good. Is there things that you look back and say, hey, I had that dialed in so well? Yeah, I don't know how easily it would be, but we're pie in the sky right now. Um, I took a blood test for um, nutrition, and I found out there were a ton of foods that I was allergic to, and everyone's, you know, very sensitive to gluten, and, you know, everyone's starting to be more conscious of what goes in your body. And obviously, as an athlete, you're always thinking about it, but I took it to a scientific level now, on, um, and where I actually had physical reactions that I was unaware of. It wasn't an uh, allergy, it was more sensitivity. And once I realized that, like, totally changed the game for me. I was way more effective, um, leaner. I had, you know, wasn't as, there were just certain things I thought, oh, that's just how I am. And I realized, no, it was actually the food I was eating. And it's like everyday things that I was putting in my body. So if there was a way to track, you know, your, your blood analysis or something internal, I know we haven't gotten there. A lot of what we're talking about is sort of metrics from the outside, but metrics from the inside. Um, I mean, that would be kind of pie in the sky dream. You must have been reading the tweets to lead to my next question. <laughs> that's, that's, this is, that's pretty eerie. So lactic acid tracking post-workout was big five years ago. Is there a new leading biomarker in your point of view? 
Anyone up in the panel? I have a point of view if no one else up here does. It sounds like you might have one. Angela. No, Angela, <laughs> you, you may not, but that was by Ty Shroff. Bam. This is me, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's, you know, there's a variety of different things you can look at in, in the blood. Uh, I think lactic acid's definitely one of them, and you can start looking at blood osmolality and a bunch of different um, parameters on sweat assays as well um, that I know are gonna be really important. Um, glucose uh, consumption as it, you know, I guess glucose expenditure as it's measured through a, a couple of different outputs, as it, as it relates to glycogen stores is actually something really interesting as well to optimize that performance so you, you feel good. I think there's a, a bunch of different things, but you say, hey, what's actually um, allowed to, yeah, in a lot of ways, I think a lot of what I t think about, the way I think about the world is democratizing this lab, um, this, this lab in a, in, with big equipment and being able to do that and democratize that to a lot of different people, not just elite athletes, but everyone. So I think allowing that, so having a, a mobile lab in, in some ways where you can actually do that uh, in a pretty quick fashion where it's not this laborious process of taking blood and urine and feces samples and you know doing it and coming back and like you know it's a three day process the whole, or at least about around doing that um, i think making that a quick iteration is actually uh one of the um biggest you know kind of di diagnostic markers in the field is i think one of the biggest opportunities um around that so it's it's not necessarily one or you know the, the biology is proven and the science is proven it's it's how can you get it done for more people Um, you know, no. sorry, oh, just a side note. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought of this. Uh, so Isaiah's wearing three. Where are the three places you have a patch? I have, I have on my tibia, yep. on my forearm, and on my core. So those all interact with, with you. They're time synchronized. Yeah, yep. so it's, it's contextualizing all these four, so it's four streams of data per patch. So it's 12 streams of data at all one time. So you can see how you can get highly, highly complex very quickly which leads to what do you do with that data? Which yeah, like any movement story. pattern. I mean, again, w right, I was just sitting here thinking, oh, I'm slouching. I'm like, oh, God, sit back up. <laughs> like, wouldn't it be interesting, you know, you put a fourth patch here, and, and it'll show you, look, you were slouching for oh, We got that algorithm hours. already. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Like, the, I mean, f we talk about kids are texting now like this all day long, and you're actually going to start developing neck problems. So there's all this stuff. I think there's just this huge world out there where, again, having metrics that's accurate in real time captured you know throughout the day um that you know again you guys are all here to solve the problem next generation here but there's there's i think there's a lot of cool stuff happening right now and and you guys are, are leading the way um this is actually a, a reference um where uh nba matt is he is he here still um you talked about in this in this tweet this is a, the, the last one we'll do before we kind of close it out um but you know talks about hustle stats that are going to be tracked and released for the first time during the 2016 playoffs so a set of metrics uh, most likely from uh you know optical uh you know cameras being able to look at hustle stats per player uh, so some type of proxy of moving around um what's your guys thoughts a on that and you know there's a deeper question here that i've thought about a long time which is you know, the ability to quantify something like heart, um, being able to understand when your body's fatigued or an athlete's fatigued, but that athlete still performs at a really high level. I think that's something that's unbelievably engaging to a lot of people, as well as um, you know, something that's really never been done before. So I'll, I'll throw those two things out there for your comments. Sorry, is this the MBA is doing? Yes, the MBA is. And I didn't click on the, the link yet, but I'm not sure what, it might be with you know via stats or or someone else, but being able to look at um, you know, essentially this idea of hustle, I would imagine some level of output. Um, you know, say if you have LeBron James, you know, after the first quarter has you know, <clears throat> you know twice the amount of output of every single every, every other person on the floor. That's pretty impressive. That's actually really engaging. You know, for myself, where like that's impressive. Can he keep that up over four quarters? Um, I think that's. That's you know I think that's you know one of the example but you know by no no means limited to that and you know obviously to get real physiology on the body you have to actually be on the body as well but I think you start to layer this data in in a pretty cool way and I think that might be an example but thoughts around either of those things 
Yeah, we, we talk about it for practice in football um, because we're with Zebra, we're able to provide the data in, in real time, both in game and in practice. And so what we talk to coaches about is that you could have a receiver who um, is running and throughout practice, and he might have hit 100% uh, of what his, you wanted his output to be, but only be done with 70% of practice. So what do you do now? Do you keep him going, or do you stop him from practicing, knowing that, well, today's Wednesday, and if I work him too hard today, he might not be ready for the game on Saturday or Sunday. Um, so from a performance standpoint, the ability to have a hustle number or an algorithm like that, I think, is very valuable. Um, and it, I think it goes back to, to um, one of the points that was made in the first panel today from the owners that were up here, um, and that Isaiah made as well. These guys are the product, right? Their their performance on the on the field and their ability to stay at a peak level um, is extremely important. And so to be able to have that information is going to be extremely valuable to coaches, uh, players, and the fans in the long run. I, I think it's an interesting question. I think the one part that I uh, get nervous about that hustle stat is that um, sometimes standing still and being in an open space is the smart move. And it would show <laughs> up as a non-hustle play. So like, there's also, there's got to be hustle, but there's got to be some sort of intelligence score there too. Like, did that person make the right move, you know? Um, so sometimes, you know, your guys run all over the court, but maybe that wasn't effective and they getting injured and, you know, they don't last the whole season. So there's, I, I think I would have to look at that statistic and kind of dig in a little bit. Yeah, that's more funny. Sometimes you look so lazy out there. Sometimes you go, I'm in the right position. They're going to run into me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing smart. It's like, I, yeah, exactly. I'm like, Steph I'm conserving Curry, my energy. You guys are running around over there. <laughs> if I was an older athlete going for a contract, I would try to say, yeah, I'm physically slow, but I'm getting mentally faster. Yeah. And I would try to go that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be EEG. You'd yeah, be able to yeah. tell that. Um, all right, so we got about a minute each. Uh, tell me what you think the next big opportunity is. Really, uh, you know, think big. It doesn't have to be necessarily um, you know, tied to one league, one team, or anything else, uh, any metric, any sport, uh, any type of broader idea where you think the biggest opportunity might be. I, I think for, uh, from New Balance's standpoint, I think um, as we start collecting more of this data, understanding why runners are getting injured and why some are performing better and taking some of that, those learnings and that knowledge into creating product that's specific for those folks, um, I think is uh, probably where I am most excited about right now from where we are, we are, we are at New Balance. Um, we just launched a 3D printed shoe at the marathon, uh, running shoe, which is, is pretty neat. So it's really based on a lot of the data we collected um, in the lab driving some of that. Um, but I think there's a whole lot of room for uh, further improvement there is running health reformed <laughs> yeah. uh, random idea but um, so many kids aren't playing sports and if there's a way to use the data to get kids moving to get the world moving I think that's the next big thing I mean you look at virtual reality people keep talking about it's it's getting people engaged and putting them in the shoes of an athlete or um, you know, a lot of kids play video games, so figuring out a way to take sedentary kids through tech, through, you know, these metrics and getting them moving, getting them engaged, I think is, you know, a whole other discussion, but I think r could be really game changing. Yeah, I would 100% gamification of the data, I think is huge. From Zebra's perspective, um, what we've enabled the NFL to do, and we'll start working with other leagues as well, is, um, to actually be able to collect this data in their environments. So the ability to, to wear something without it uh, being obtrusive to the play on the field uh, and actually collect this data is the first step. The second step, and I think where the big opportunity is, is analyzing this data. So we now have two years worth of game day data and to be able to get that into the hands of, of engineers and data scientists to be able to create new metrics, to be able to understand you know, how can we quantify pressure on a quarterback or how can we quantify going back to almost a safety or, or a cornerback? You don't have any statistics on those individuals, um, but being able to quantify exactly how good or how not good their coverage was, um, that's, I think, where the next step is, is really being able to analyze this data and have actual insights and value that we can take from it. All right, cool. I'll, I'll add my own perspective real quick, which I, 
I think is broad in a way to, and I think I mentioned already, but this, this broad quantification of the entire human body um, with real world data, not just kind of these, these snapshots, but real world data captured over longer periods of time, which can really lead to different ways to you know, quantify performance or quantify disease states that have just not been captured as of yet and not captured in little snapshots in a lab. And I think there's um, limitless potential in, in being able to do that in a way that is, is uh, unbelievably profound and can really, really change the way we think about our, our lives and our health and uh, the way we look at ourselves moving forward. Uh, with that, this has been an amazing job. You guys have done awesome. Uh, I want to say, don't forget to, you, you can meet us, the speakers, uh, at the Career Cafe, and it's open, but please do not miss the last panel of the day at 3 p.m., the ever-evolving world of sports journalism. Thanks, guys. <laughs>